Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and I'm here with Noma Langamushali Moses from HealthyBlackWoman.com. How are you doing today, Noma? I'm doing great, Boyce. How are you? I'm doing really well, really well. Now, you wrote this article uh, that you, you put on NaturallyMoi.com, M-O-I, and, um, and the title of this article, um, it really got my attention. It says, Why Black People Stay Persistently Broke, or Poor, Broke, and Struggling. And, uh, and the image also got my attention. There's an image of a black woman crying. And, uh, and it kind of reminds, reminded me of, you know, how you have so many people that, um, you know, where they take pride in how much they've overcome, how much they've endured, and how much they've made it through. And it almost seems that sometimes there's so much focus on surviving that we don't take the time to think about what it takes to actually thrive. You know, like, you know, thriving is beyond surviving. So maybe we should focus on getting beyond the surviving point so that we can, you know, see something more. And uh, the first thing you talk about is you mentioned that according to the Urban Institute, and I'm quoting, quoting your words here, two primary reasons why African-American families do not accumulate nearly as much wealth as their white counterparts is that they have higher student debt and a very significantly lower uh, likelihood of getting large amounts of money from family members. Um, so let's start with the first one on student loan debt. Um, you know what what brought that to mind for you? Um, you know, in terms of why you chose to write about it. Well, um, I looked at the report and it was um, it stood out to me because it's true, and I do see that um, every day. I think you know I taught at a community college um, for some years, and I did notice the dis- the, the difference between. Um, you know, the white students and the black students. Um, and even at a community college, you could tell that a lot of people were, uh, a lot of the people who were struggling were the black students. Um, and it re- actually is true because what happens is everybody feels like, okay, if I'm going to make it in life, I got to get a good job <laughs> and make some good money and then, um, you know, go out there and try and do the best that I can. So what they do is they go to college, right, to increase their chances of getting that good job or making so much more money. But the problem is we're getting to a point where people are now spending so much money on college that they never get out from under that bill that comes after they're done with college. And then they end up fighting that bill for years and never really recover from that. So that's the first thing. Um, Where with other families other than black people, you'll find that um, they're paying out of pocket. They've been saving since uh, their kid was born. By the time their kid goes to college, they pay for it out of pocket. Then the kid uh, gets to graduate and be free from the debt, from the payments and what have you, and they make a fresh start. And of course, they're going to start saving, investing, and making and, and building wealth as opposed to the person who starts out in debt and just deals with the debt until, you know, until their own kid is in college. Okay, so so you're, you're pointing out two things. One, um, uh, excessive student loan debt, and then two, oh, uh, the family inheritance, uh, which impacts the debt issue because, you know, if you don't have an inheritance, then you're going to have to borrow money to go to school. So many of us are starting behind the eight ball uh, as opposed to e- at least even or maybe even ahead, right? So, okay, um, now, uh, and it's not just an inheritance, sorry. It's not just an inheritance. Some people's parents actually just pay for them to go to college. Um, but if your own parents, for instance, are still dealing with poverty, they're not going to be able to pay for you to go to college. Does that make sense? Yeah, or, or, if, they're, or if they're dealing with their own student loan debt, right? I right. Mean, now you have generations of parents that still... Um, that are still dealing with debt from 20 years ago, <laughs> and they, and they, so you know, they're with their kids. They're not able to take on that additional massive amount of debt. I mean, because now, um, you know, a lot of people may not have paid attention to this, but the cost of of college tuition um, has skyrocketed far beyond the rest of the economy. Um, and I, I think honestly that you know, just as an economist, I can say that the. Um, the the part of the reason for the price the cost increase is due to the ready availability of loans uh that, that having so many student loans available what that does is that inflates the cost of attending college because people are now you know able to say well you know what the tuition is 30,000 a year I can pay it because I can just borrow it and pay it later. And what it's done is it's created a whole generation of financial slaves. Uh, they say, hey, we'll give you the college education now. Uh, you just owe us $200,000 and you just pay it when you can. And and so and it sounds good at the time because you're thinking, oh, well, that's the future. I don't have to worry about the future because the future is not here. you know. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they 
they're, they end up stuck in debt. I think this generation, I want to say uh, everyone under the age of 35 in that generation, the average uh, person in that, you know, in that age group is going to die in debt. They'll never pay their loans off. They'll never be back uh, in the black financially. Um, so I, it, it, what it did, what it did was it made me start to wonder, uh, is it really worth it to even pay uh, to go to college? Um, maybe it's better to learn how to start a business. Maybe it's better to go to a less expensive school and then learn entrepreneurship at the same time because cor- corporations aren't really uh, producing jobs like they used to, especially for African Americans. So uh, maybe it's time to kind of have creative solutions. Um, you know, to these financial issues. Now, now the inheritance issue or the, 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 the issue of getting money from your parents, I think is interesting too, um, because, you know, we have this, this intergenerational wealth gap that's consistently existed in the black community for hundreds of years because, uh, you know, our well, a lot of our wealth was stolen. A lot of black people, were, for example, were run out of the South, and when they left, many of them left their land, and whites took the land. And the government still hasn't dealt with that. They're still not going back and dealing with these very real... Um, this very real theft that occurred, uh, which which leads to a reparations conversation, but there is that that wealth gap there um, that you know just really uh, causes us to sometimes instead of inheriting money, we inherit headaches and we inherit stress, you know, and it's right. it's it's not easy. Um, now I want to ask you about something that I know you believe in deeply, which is, uh, and I think this is important to talk about uh, because I think your background from Botswana and your family kind of plays a part in this. Um, you actually mentioned in your article briefly the importance of a building family as as a tool for wealth building. Uh, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I say a lot is I think that we have to stop starting over and starting over because what you'll see with um, at least, you know, we, you and I both obviously live in the United States. What you see in the United States is the people who have wealthy families assuming that their um, wealth wasn't built off the back of slave labor. Okay, let's just take that take that out of the equation for a second and just look at people who've built wealth and sustained it gener- from generation to generation to generation. Those are people whose families stay together, you know, um, and they typically have two people in the household either both earning an income or one earning an income, one supporting the other one earning an income. In other words, a, a, a work at home or stay at home or whatever kind of wife like I am who fully supports that the household while her husband earns money and then also supplements his income the way that um, you the way that you can so that's a very different scenario than somebody who has to struggle to basically put food on the table um, and then have nothing left for tomorrow or f- let alone next year or the next generation those are two separate things and I think that we can we can acknowledge that you know you do start out uh, behind okay some people do have an advantage there there's white privilege there's all kinds of things that affect us however I think it's important to focus on on doing what you can with the things that you can control there's some things that you just don't have any control over so can we control the fact that our relationships are better or not um, some might say no but I do think that there are a lot of things that you can do um, let's let's look at family for a second, okay? A lot of people, for instance, come from a family where maybe generation after generation after generation there's been no dad in the home. Um, I think you have to proactively think, okay, I'm going to do something different and then actually do something different, <laughs> you know? Uh, because I think sometimes we talk about doing things and then we don't and we follow the patterns of the people that raised us or the people that raised them and so on and so on. So there does there, does, there is a requirement for something very, very significant, to change and I think that it can and I think that it should well you know I think um, people underestimate the importance of, of um, family planning uh, when it comes to wealth building uh, you know from the male side it, for example if a guy has a lot of children with a lot of different women that's a lot of money that has to go out in a lot of different directions a lot of money a lot of emotional energy a lot of time um, and those guys tend to have a negative net worth um, throughout their lives. They're, they're not able to really catch up most of the time. Even guys that are wealthy, you'll see a lot of fam- rich and famous athletes who will take that approach, the baby mama model, if you will. And, um, and, and many of those guys end up in bankruptcy because the financial obligations end up eating away at what they have. And then on the flip side, uh, we know single moms, uh, their net, I think their median net worth was like $5 or something like that. Um, and so we know the struggle of, of the single mother. So the logical conclusion is that when a family uh, earns its money as a unit, 
you're more likely to be uh, economically stable, economically successful. And and you know, and I can even I would even go as far as saying that maybe the the type of unit you form um, isn't it, it maybe it doesn't if if marriage and family isn't for you. I think having some sort of cooperative economic system that you're a part of can really go a long way. You know, like I even think about the people that I work with in my own family and my friends. Um, you know, when we do our our thing every day with your black world and all that, a lot of us took the scary plunge of leaving our jobs and stuff like that. Um, you know, to do this, and and we help each other. You know, we uh, and, and and I think having support, having help, um, can just go a long way. And and everyone's contributing, everyone's taking. And I think that's the the idea. That's the idea of family, right? Um, you know, absolutely. So, oh, go ahead, please. Because marriage is a part. Marriage is a partnership. So essentially, you have to form partnerships and stop being on your own. But the thing about it is why I speak so much about um, marriage is that, first of all, um, you're going to, you know, I, I, I try to approach this subject very carefully because then it turns as into this whole thing of, you know, you're pointing the finger and blaming single mothers and so forth. But statistics don't lie, you know. Um, it, does, it does follow that if you raise your kids in a good functional two-parent home, they do tend to come out better on the other side, you know. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, and that's not just financially, um, that's socially as well. They do better in school, they're less likely to um, end up with teenage pregnancies, which again perpetuates the cycle of poverty. So there are a lot of benefits. Um, whether you, you know, you have the Christian approach to everybody should get married or not, I'm not even on that tip. I'm just saying it from a very intellectual, logical level that it's better to have two people taking care of uh, however many kids there are. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is if there's two people contributing to this bank account or whatever it is, um, you have a better chance of putting something away so that those kids can go to college. Uh, without incurring the debt. Just like the article says, this really rang true for me because I, I've seen the differences. I've seen people who don't even bother to believe that they could even go to college because they've never seen anybody go to college. Um, and then there are people who've seen everybody in their family go to college and didn't uh, have debts or anything like that, and they just know that they're going to go. Um, so there is a difference. Um, and I do think that we do have to shift the way that we look at things and the way that we function, um, if not for ourselves, for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. It's little things like when you're about to make a decision about, you know, here I am, I'm married. It's kind of tough. I'm not talking about condoning outrageous things like beatings and cheatings and so forth. I'm talking about really making a relationship work. When you look at it and you're thinking, this is really, really uncomfortable. Um, there does have to come a point where you consider that, okay, it's uncomfortable for me right now, but if I decide to walk away from this because it's uncomfortable for me, I'm creating a discomfort that's going to echo into eternity. Because it's going to go from generation to generation to generation to generation. Those are the things that we used to we need to look at. Because I think that there has become this narrow-minded way of thinking where you just look at your current situation and you don't look at the ramifications of what it's going to do going forward. And for me, every day that I wake up, I'm not only thinking about today. I'm thinking about next year. I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about their kids and so on and so on. Everything that I do is about that. It's not just about me. And I think that's where... A lot of people need to make a shift. Mm. Yeah, so it's a matter of being proactive as opposed to just reactive. And, and you know, and proactive means you're planning for the future and not just dealing with what's in front of you today. And I, I think that's important. Right. Um, and I think we both agree that, you know, that you, you create and you build the life that you want. And, and, you, and you taught this to scores of young women um, as, you know, teaching at, community, at, you know, at the university you were with. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and, you know, and so I think that that's an, it's important that people hear this from you, um, you know, because, uh, you know, if you don't learn how to play the game of life early and, and make um, a, a direct concerted effort to build the life that you want for yourself, then you're going to kind of get whatever life is thrown at you. And then, right. you know, you'll be sort of rejoicing over what you've overcome and how, how much you've survived as opposed to having a chance to talk about how you've thrived. And I, I definitely right. have an interest in seeing people thrive as opposed to just survive. So um, thank you, Noma Lang. I really appreciate your time.
Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for checking us out. Uh, this is Noma Lang and Moses. Uh, she's with HealthyBlackWoman.com. I hope you'll go and support her website. And I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. And you ain't got to support me um, unless you want to. <laughs> yes, we do. And, uh, no, no, no. They, they, they don't have to. I, 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 but I'm, I'm appreciative. I'm, I'm so appreciative. Um, and uh, until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace. <laughs>